Hi kids, thanks for tuning in to today's screencast on chapter 1, section 2, The Power to Rule. Basically, we're going to focus on the five sources of power, which you can see my cursor is circling that little graphic organizer. That is what you're going to draw on your paper. And you're going to be adding some notes while I'm talking. And we're basically trying to answer the question, uh, what are the five sources of power and how does your teacher apply the five sources of power in your classroom on a daily basis? So let's get started. How about if we open up the graphic organizer, which says the five sources of power here. And while I read this little blurb here at the top, you could actually start drawing your graphic organizer by putting power in the center and five little circles on the outside saying where power comes from. These are the sources, okay? This diagram shows five sources of power exercised by people in a variety of roles. Political leaders often combine these sources of power to get citizens to act in a certain way. For example, a president might speak to the nation combining formal authority and persuasion about offering tax breaks, which is a reward, to people who buy fuel-efficient cars. Okay, so that was just one of the many examples that we're going to talk about here. Well, I hope you had time to draw this, and we're actually going to start with coercion, because when you read Chapter 1, Section 2, the very first power it describes is coercion. So coercion, power springs from the power holder's ability to punish or penalize others. And there you see uh, Mr. Police Officer holding up his arm using a form of coercion. Uh, to get people to do what they want. Now the thing that's important to remember about coercion is it doesn't have to be a violent um, source of of punishment, okay? And um, it doesn't have to be brute force. So you can still punish and, and penalize others and use the power of coercion without using violence and without using brute force. Okay, for example, um, if you're driving down a 35 mile an hour road and you're going 55 miles an hour and about a quarter mile up the road you see a police officer sitting in his car with a radar gun, well, you're probably going to slow down because they're using a form of co coercion really because you know that that radar is going to pick up the speed that you're doing and you're not going the speed limit and you're going to get a ticket, or you might even get points, or you may lose your license at that point. You know, it just depends on your record. But that actually is a form of coercion. The cop didn't even have to say anything. Just by seeing that car up ahead, you're going to slow down because you don't want to get a ticket, you don't want your insurance to go up, you don't want to get points on your license, and, you know, that actually is a form of coercion. Okay, now how does your teacher use coercion? Well, for me, for example, of course I don't use brute force, but I do use things like uh, detention, calling home, staying after school for, you know, not doing your homework, maybe sending you down to the discipline office. Um, you know, I, I use coercion on a daily basis. Not that I like to, believe me, if I didn't have to, I wouldn't use that power. But that's a couple of examples of how I use coercion. All right, let's go over to formal authority. Formal authority is another type of power, and here we have what seems to be either a principal, you know, because of the flag, he could be at a school, it could be a congressman, or it could be the president, actually. And uh, formal authority, the power comes from the power holder's position and duties within an organization. Now, basically what that means is that someone is given the power of formal authority because they're performing their job duties and those job duties are usually written down in some sort of legal document it could be a contract it could be a constitution it could be a birth certificate it could be many different things that says this is your job this is what you have to do because of that you have formal authority which is power over somebody else okay so one example that we already read about was the president uses formal authority because 
he has to give a State of the Union address. That's part of his job duties. He gives a State of the Union address in January, usually around January 25th, 26th, 27th. Our president just gave his. And basically, because it's part of his duties, it's in his job description. And when he gets elected and he swears and takes that oath, that becomes a power to him. He has formal authority over the United States citizens. Okay? How do I use it? Well, I go to college. I get a contract when I get a job. I have certain job duties for being a teacher. And because I signed that contract and it says that I need to teach kids, um, that gives me formal authority over students. So there you go. Um, I can use coercion and formal authority every single day in the classroom. Okay? Let's go to expertise. Expertise is kind of an easy one. Here you see um, this woman who I guess could either be a doctor, a nurse, nurse practitioner. However, the point is power derives from the power holder's specific skills or expertise. Okay? So knowledge, sk skills, um, education is a very powerful thing. Okay? So when you have certain skills in a certain area, it gives you the power over whoever it is that you're dealing with. So, for example, a, uh, let's see, a carpenter knows a lot about building houses, okay? So they bring their skills and expertise to the table, and whoever's house they're building, they have power over because of expertise. There's many other examples, but let's just get down to how does the teacher use expertise? Well, obviously, guys, I went to college to become a social studies teacher. So I can teach civics, I can teach economics, I can teach U.S. history, I can teach global studies. Because I have the knowledge and the skills, and I am an expert in those areas. And that gives me power over you guys. Now, if you have some sort of skills or knowledge that I don't have, then you have power over me. Expertise, that is. Okay? All right, so so far we've done coercion with the cop. We've done formal authority with, let's say, the president. We've done expertise with this doctor. And now we're going to go down to persuasion. Okay, the fourth source of power comes from the power holder's ability to persuade or influence others. So here you have a minister at a pulpit. And that minister is using his power of persuasion to get people to do what he wants them to do because he's got that type of personality. There's lots of people that have that persuasive personality. They can motivate people. They can butter them up. They can persuade them to do what they want them to do. So a very good example is the minister. Okay. Also a lawyer. A lawyer is very good at persuading people. Well, how about a teacher? Teacher is supposed to use little tricky ways to persuade the kids to do what they need to do. Motivation. Um, not rewards. Not to be mixed up with rewards, but persuasion. For example, if the teacher says, or if I say, come on guys, don't you want to graduate and be a functioning citizen, know where to go to vote, get a job, support your family, have a car, have a house? You know, don't you want to do all that stuff? So do your schoolwork so that you can become a functioning citizen of the United States. Okay? There's many ways that teachers use persuasion. That's just one example. Okay, last but not least is the power of rewards. Here we have a secretary. I'm assuming she's a secretary. And rewards comes from the power holder's ability to give something of value, such as money, responsibility, or praise. Now, I'm thinking that from this picture, maybe her boss is using the power of rewards for her doing her job, and maybe she's going to get a raise. Or maybe she's going to get 
some extra time off to spend with her family. Or maybe she won't have to work Christmas Eve next year. Okay? But the power of rewards comes from somebody giving something of value to someone else. And it makes them very powerful. So, for example, your parents. Let's say your parents tell you that for every A you get, they're going to give you $200. Well, that's pretty good rewards, all right? And so they could also give you maybe, okay, maybe the car. You're allowed to use the car. Or maybe we'll pay for your insurance or something like that if you're good in school. Um, but that's much different than a teacher. A teacher doesn't use money to reward kids. A teacher shouldn't say to the kids, if you're good, I'm going to reward you with an A. Okay? No. No, that's wrong. Because teachers are supposed to be objective, not subjective. We're supposed to give you your grade based on data, not whether we like you or not. Okay? So we shouldn't say, if you're good, we'll give you an A. That's not rewards. But what we could say is, if you do really well, you get a homework pass. Or maybe if you complete your homework, you get a piece of candy. Or maybe you get some extra computer time. Or maybe you get a chance to watch a movie after school or some sort of reward. Okay? Not money. Teachers don't pay students money as a reward. And we do not give A's as a reward. So just make sure you got that clear. Okay? Those pretty much are the five sources of power. Coercion, rewards, persuasion, formal authority, expertise. Now, a couple things I would write down is that um, there's a sentence in here that says um, that people and governments use these powers sometimes in combination, okay, and sometimes just by themselves. So I could actually use all five in one day, or I could just use one or two in a day. Okay, so that's kind of important, and that says that right here. Governments throughout the ages have relied on each of these types of powers, often in combination. There's another thing that you probably should write down. Um, the power to rule can be used for positive or negative ends or purposes. So, through the centuries, some rulers have used their power to build cities, promote the arts, or feed the poor. That would be positive ways. And others have abused their power by looting their subjects' wealth, turning captives into slaves, and even committing mass murder. That would be using power in negative ends or purposes. So I don't want everybody to always think power is a bad thing, because it's not. It can also be used in positive ways. The very last thing I want to go over before we end, and you read this section by yourself, is abuse of power. Basically, abuse of power means that government or people are using their power, misusing their power, and they're using it for unethical or harmful ways. So we just want to look at this quote here. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. How does that relate to abuse of power? Well, very easily. Because there's two types of government. There's limited government and there's unlimited. So let's talk about limited government. Limited government means that the government can't do whatever they want because they have limits. They're limited by a contract of some sort. They're limited by a constitution. They're limited by laws. So power tends to corrupt. It's pretty much talking about limited government, meaning that power, limited power is not supposed to turn corrupt, but sometimes it can. And there are certain times in the U.S. history where um, a president or a congress member has turned corrupt or a judge or something like that. However, they don't always turn corrupt. Well, look at the second part of the quote, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, that's talking about unlimited government. Unlimited government mean, means the power, the, the government has no limits. They can do whatever they want. They're not limited by a constitution, a contract, or laws. They can just do whatever they want. It's unlimited. Well, guys, absolute power corrupts absolutely always. Unlimited power always turns corrupt, no bones about it. Okay? So, power tends to corrupt. Sometimes limited government can turn corrupt, not always. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Unlimited power always turns corrupt. Okay? 
So those are pretty much the most important.